this is Thessaloniki in 2035. I don't know whether to laugh or to cry. <laughs> it's hard. There's lots of solar panels. And this is very typical, by the way, for artificial intelligence. It cannot make a decent car. Very difficult. If you have people, they'll be missing fingers and things like that. But it's still entertaining, you know, I, I think. So the purpose of what I'm talking about tonight is not to predict anything. It's very difficult to predict when things change every 10 days. But to be prepared. To be prepared. And that means to prepare your mind for what is possible. To be open to possibilities. We cannot go into the future based on fear. Okay? If we do that, we generate the same thing again, which is negative things. That doesn't mean we should be stupid and ignore things. Yeah. Obviously not, but we cannot go into the future based on fear. I want to start with the three revolutions. You're familiar with the first one. Uh, your CEO, the CEO of the company, uh, already pointed in that direction. The digital revolution is mostly about artificial intelligence, you know, thinking machines. I'll go into detail on that later. But the digital revolution is basically making everything smart. That's the bottom line. And sometimes that means that it feels like it's a threat to us because the machines are like everywhere now. And, you know, our mobile phone has about 50 functions that used to be in other places. Like it plays music, it does our banking, it does your dating, you know, all these things used to be somewhere else. And many of us now have more relationship time with the screen than with people. That's probably not such a good thing, but I think we can solve this problem. What's much more important is the second revolution, sustainability. Because in your lifetime, in the next 10 years, right, average lifetime, we're switching from the fossil fuel industry to the green renewable industry and the next generation nuclear industry. Right now, it's only in some countries, you know, very small percentage of energy. Greece is actually doing very good here in solar. Right? Germany is about 47%. But in the very near future, by 2030, we can go carbon neutral in most places in Europe. Not in Brazil and in India, you know, so that very big challenge. Yeah. But this is where all the money is going. If people aren't investing today in artificial intelligence, they're investing in climate technology. Battery power, new kinds of airplane fuels, uh, analytics systems, and so on and so on. I mean, we're wasting a huge amount of energy on, on agriculture that's backwards, and you know, all these things are happening. The third revolution is the human revolution. If you're my age, the purpose of business was to improve financial you know, Lee, and, and also create progress, okay? So that is completely different because the baby boomer generation, the Gen X, and, the, and you know, my generation, we were interested in only the sort of uh, growing part of things. Now we have younger people, roughly between 20 and 40, coming into business. I'll talk more about that a little bit later. And they care about a little bit more. People, planet, purpose, and prosperity. Not just prosperity. If you just care about prosperity, our time is finished by 2050. Because right? we're taking and taking, but not giving back. And that is the reality of what we're up against. And that changes politics. It changes who we vote for. Great example is the vote in Germany a few days ago. Right? Why did, for the first time ever since 1945, a right-wing party won many seats in Turing and Sachsen and in Germany in general, not a majority, thankfully, but more than ever before. And one of, and one of those parties is officially declared anti-democratic. That's not good news. And why is that happening? Because people are worried and they vote for somebody that has simple solutions. But you know, the future isn't simple. We have to have a lot of wisdom to actually make that work. If you take this paradigm, this could be the ticket for the future of Greece. Obviously, Greece is not going to be the leader in artificial intelligence. That's already taken. But Greece is doing great on the green revolution. And many products can be generated that you can sell around the world. 
So a very important part. We have many other things happening that I don't have time to talk about. Quantum computing, nuclear fusion, genetic engineering, genome editing, biotechnology, and geoengineering. Roughly in 20 years, we can probably prevent cancer using genome technology and artificial intelligence. Not heal cancer, but prevent it. Think about that for a sec. Diabetes, same thing. We're looking at the end of long-standing diseases in the not too far future and for our children. The possibility is clear in front of us. In digital, especially here in Greece, there's four pieces. Information technology and AI, biotechnology, which is to create new materials based on synthetic biology. Right here in Salonika, of course, you have Pfizer. This is what they do, deriving new ideas from computing for healthcare. Energy and climate technology. And lastly, of course, the new sector is artificial intelligence kind of coming up by its own. But AI is not really a technology. It's a science. So it kind of goes into this overall thing. If you're looking to invest, for example, or to start new businesses, any of these four would be a good place because we're going to need lots of this. And that's changing our entire landscape. And you can see there was a huge boom in investing in AI. There's a huge boom investing in climate technology. And whoever understands how to make this a reality is going to be the next Google. Some people have said that we'll have very soon, in roughly three to five years, the first company over a $5 trillion valuation in climate technology. So it's mind-boggling all the possibilities that we see here. You see here a synthetic biology. This is a shoe that's made from spider silk, you know, the thing that you make the bulletproof vests. But this is actually done in the factory. So it's taken the spider silk model, the, the molecules, and and building it in the factory. So you can print this shoe. You can go to the shoe store and have the shoe printed for you in different patterns and colors. Synthetic biofuel right now is less than 1% of airplanes that can use this because it's very expensive. If this follows the pattern, for example, of Spotify, which has now has 120 million users, paying 10 euros, then in 10 years, we can have most of the airplanes use different fuel. Lab-grown meat. This is basically meat that grows in a factory on the molecular level. And it's kind of like having meat not from a dead animal, but from animal cells. You know, it sounds disgusting, but actually it's not. So this is how we can feed 10 billion people. So these things are happening everywhere. They're happening with cacao plants. Now the first company in California has created an artificial cacao bean that can be produced in a week, not in six months. So think about all the solutions that are coming up here. So if we take this all together, I call it big blue, big green, big blue, not IBM, but you know technology, big green and big purple. Purple is the color in Indian history for humans and for chakra and so on. And we have to put this together and say, really the program for the future is to combine all of these, depending on what we prefer. The main challenge today is not that we can't do things, but we have to decide what we want to do. What is the most plausible goal for well, my company, for the country, and of course also for Europe? So. Let's take a look at how Greece is doing. Research from Dia, Dia Nonesis, I'll show the slide later with that, showing not so good news on Greece. On the digital side, big blue, Greece is pretty much the least fastest. You know, the, the NRI is the Network Resource Index, and that is how networked the country is. Greece is compared very low to some of the other countries. And there are lots of reasons for this. I don't have time to get into it, but this is something we must fix, clearly. And I'm sure you're already aware of this. However, Greece is doing great with solar energy, number two worldwide right after Chile. So this is a very big plus for the country is to invest in this and to continue on this. 
There was a great research, same company. This is in Greek, so I, I put the English part of there. From the same company, February 24, showing basically what's happening with people being trusting companies or trusting each other. There has been an increase in trusting family, the armed forces, scientists, and so on. But a decrease, not so good here, in employee organizations, in banking, a decrease in trust, NGOs, political parties. That's quite interesting. This is just a few months ago. So on the big purple side, Greece needs some work, finding purpose, bringing people together. So the bottom line is this. We're going to have every science available to need to fix food, to fix water, to fix climate, to end diseases. But what we can't do is fix the lack of collaboration. That's a human thing. You know, technology will not fix that, right? So I use a good old Greek word in my presentations a lot, telos. Telos in Greek, uh, I studied ancient Greek, by the way, so I, I read a lot of about this, you know, 40 years ago. It's more described as the end of something, the destination. We need to figure out what destination we want. Do we want to live in a world that is basically automated by machines? Do we want to keep our culture? What is the goal? Basically, with all of this, you know, this is a really important message, is the second one here, which is the other Greek word for purpose, skopos. We take them together, we have to figure out what exactly do we want to achieve when we use artificial intelligence? Do we want to just make business faster, make more money? Right now, I'm a little bit worried about companies like OpenAI Microsoft and others, you know, creating AI pretty much for their own purpose rather than for our purpose. So, for example, for a bank, this would be crucial. You know, you serve the customer, not yourself, uh, by creating systems that are a lock-in, for example. So here we can uh, safely say great talk from, from um, Johan Rockström at TED the other day, just a few weeks ago. He describes our time as the most the fastest economic transition in human history. So we're going up here, technological disruption, clearly political progress, or political non-progress maybe, mass movements. Climate change will lead to a lot of mass movements that are like a hundred times of extinction rebellion. I mean, this is already happening, but market forces and so on, and we go into a world that's gonna be like this, zero loss of nature, sustainable food systems, zero carbon energy in 25 years. Think about that for a second. And how we're going to get there? Well, there's going to be a lot of discussion and, and back and forth. And of course, the European Commission has, has written greatly about how we're going to actually achieve this. But anyway, the other thing that's happening is that the millennials, the Gen Y, are taken over. So roughly 25 to 40, 45 maybe even. That is because COVID had a delay, so we couldn't do anything. And then the wars came and there was also a delay. But now basically people of that age are coming into the workforce. And people my age are giving the money to their children. So it's a huge shift. You can see that here in this slide. Millennials in importance, they're increasing like this. If we zoom in a little bit, it looks better. So. Basically, the curve of millennials running companies, having jobs, running politics. Look at Brazil, because Lula is, uh, is not a millennial, but everybody around him is. <laughs> That's changing everything. Get ready for this, because first of all, it's going to be at least half women, probably more than half, who are going to be there. Because we have a lot more women in, as millennials than we have men. So very, very big change coming up in so many ways. That brings me to tourism. A very juicy topic for Greece. 25% of Greece revenue tourism. This is an AI mock-up of Santorini. So that's neither Santorini, not they not really have that many cruise ships. But 5,230 cruise ships came to Greece in 2023. Can you believe that? I mean, that's a huge number. And now we're at the point where we have to think about, okay, we need to decide if we're going to be a giant museum like Venice, 
a, a stage set, essentially, when this isn't real anymore. It's like Disneyland. Do we want to be like that in Europe? Or do we want to actually do something that has a long-term future? That doesn't mean we're not going to have tourism, but what are we banking on here? Very important question. When you take this mantra that I showed earlier, we can use technology to make tourism better, less pollution, more organization, better ships, better ports, all of that. We can use technology to create a sustainability revolution. We must make decisions, which means sometimes we have less cruise ships. That's quite lucky. In Norway, the government has just passed a law. You cannot enter a fjord in 2025 with a regular cruise ship with a normal engine. You have to use electric engine to go into the fjord because of all the smoke and everything. Right? So the purpose, of course, relates to that as well. The other thing that's happening, of course, Greek in Greece, 21% of the world's shipping is Greek, 61% in Europe, market share. It's about high time that we figure out how to do this in a new way. And I think this is happening, but a lot of shipping giants around the world, Greek shipping giants, have been sort of, you know, neither here nor there with their efforts. That needs to change, because shipping is essential, obviously. But, you know, this again, this is the AI telling us what it will look like with alternative energies and different kinds of fuels. Same principle applies. Here we have Barcelona, just a few weeks ago where uh, people in Barcelona are very upset about tourism and about the rent going up. So they go and they spray a tourism, a tourist with a hand, with a little water gun, you know. To, I mean, this is a symbol, obviously. But this is happening around the world. I think it happened in Santorini just a few weeks ago as well. And the bottom line is that business as usual, as we did for a long time, is ending. And this is good news. It's not bad news. You are lucky that you still have business as usual in tourism, like we have in Switzerland, where I live. But we're going to have to do something to invent the next window to think about what comes after this. And, and this is, of course, a challenge because we have to understand what it means, where we are going. And here's the bottom line. We can totally do this because we are already doing it. This is the growth curve of GDP worldwide. And this is what's happening with emissions. What we need to do is to bring up this curve. Greece has been doing pretty good on the GDP, but needs some more. If we could bring up this curve and this curve down, then we have achieved what we need. And we'll take policy, we'll take science and technology, and we'll take the three revolutions to be realized. Look at this chart. This is the energy climate innovation chart of the future. All of these things, precision agriculture, battery storage, climate fintech, the smart grid, all already happening. And a lot of that hap is happening here in Greece. Right? So you can safely say green is the new digital. We don't just invest in smart machines and AI, we also invest here. Of course, in the end, that comes down to being very similar. So let me talk about AI and what it means. I have some stats and research on this to share, but basically let's make a definition first. Artificial intelligence, computer systems that turn information and data into knowledge. That is Demis Hassabis, who led the company that beat the Go champion of the world, you know, the Korean game, the Chinese game Go. They built this. So the most complicated game in the world. So you can say, well, if a computer has knowledge, what do we do? I mean, we are knowledge workers, right? You, you guys don't work in factories. I hope not. But I'm a knowledge worker. If a machine has knowledge, what kind of knowledge does a machine have? Well, the answer is obvious, right? Machine knowledge, <laughs> which is patterns. Like ChatGPT looks at a trillion facts and gives me the, the most plausible answer. It doesn't think. It's not alive. It's a pattern. It's like a parrot, right? It's looking at all of those things, a really powerful parrot, repeating things. It is a machine that can learn and reason 
built wow. upon vast amounts of data and complex algorithms. It imitates human thought processes to provide tailored learning experiences. I sense a shadow over this marvel, a hidden danger lurking within. Uh huh. Dear Bill, as you know, I am a proponent of self-examination and seeking wisdom. That's true. Tell me, what might we gain from this new form of intelligence you have created? Oh, you don't know how much Microsoft has been in the limelight recently. If those big companies don't come out and talk about AI, I don't know how much the stock prices will fall. To be serious, Socrates, artificial intelligence has the potential to revolutionize heuristic education. We can utilize AI to personalize learning, allowing each individual... You can watch the rest on YouTube. But this is a fake discussion between Bill Gates and Socrates, of course. It's very interesting to see this was made with an AI, taken statements from Bill Gates and from Socrates, obviously, and made a video in like 14 seconds. So what's happening here in the industry, if you're a small, medium-sized company, is crucial. We're no longer just an industry 4.0, which is connected, connected industry. We are in 5.0. Industry 5.0 is intelligent, smart, learns, this is how we're going to reduce inefficiencies by 50-60%, bring down pollution by 90%, invent new products. The pharma industries are inventing new medication based on what the AI analyzes and figures out already new medication modules you know, based on what AI is doing. Very powerful stuff. So there are four components here. First, the machine kind of cognifies, you know, understands what's happening and then basically augments us, like a search engine, like a virtual reality thing, virtual reality glasses, so we can go farther, and we can think different. And then the last one is automation. Like when you're driving a self-driving car or assisted car and so on and so on. So these four pieces, cognification, augmentation, virtualization, and automation, they're driving change in all industries. It's not rocket science. Yeah, we're not talking about Black Mirror here or Ex Machina. Uh, we're talking about basically making things smart, helping humans to work better and faster, to virtualize data and to look at things like if you're a lawyer or a doctor, now we can dive into the information like Tom Cruise in Minority Report. Powerful stuff. Automation is overrated. Of course, we want to automate if we can, but it's actually very hard to do. We don't really have self-driving cars. Have you seen any here? I haven't seen any here. Automation of driving is difficult. You know, we can just kind of use this. For example, if I'm too tired, the system will take over. That's already a very big plus compared to what we used to have. In banking, this leads, for example, to a great opportunity for personalization. Using the data to make customized products for each customer without a person sitting down and making it based on the analytics. Having a different interface to your app, to your website, creating new products based on the AI. This is already happening in China. was launched yesterday. The uh, uh, Baidu guys and I think Tencent as well launched a new app where you can do all these things to create your own financial products based on your information. Very powerful stuff. So when we look at this direction, 10% of revenue increases can be gotten by personalizing. I mean, this is, of course, what Netflix does, right? You're familiar with that. Amazon, Spotify. Why do you not leave Spotify? Most of you have bought Spotify, I'm sure. Right? Why do you not leave to get free music on YouTube? Because of your information. The personalization, the playlist, the service. It's 10 euros. It's not 100 euros. We used to pay 20 euros for a CD. And here's the other thing when we look in this direction for banking. We really need to rehumanize, not to dehumanize. The idea that we're going to fire people because we have an artificial intelligence that does their job faster is both a nightmare and an illusion. Because what AI does, it gives us a power tool so that our routine work is done by the machine, like fact checking and filing and all of them, making appointments and all of these things. And we can grow above that. 
if your job is 90% routine, like a call center, you are in trouble. The machine will eventually do the job of about 2 million people in call centers because it will speak fluent Greek if you speak regular Greek or German, and it will understand what you say. And it will speak to you with the voice of Tom Cruise, if you want, whatever voice you want. Very important, you know, Apple already has an interface, the Apple Vision Pro, three-dimensional. This device costs 4,000 euros. So it's only for like the people who really want to play but you should try it out in the Apple Store. I think it's coming to Greece uh, in two months, I think. It allows you to do banking as if you were in a video game. To look at the whole world in 360 information, pull out data, shovel things around. It's a whole different experience. Imagine you can do that for insurance, as a lawyer, as a real estate broker. And the machine, this will not cost 4,000 euros forever, you know, it eventually becomes cheap enough for us to buy one. Like I said earlier, Tom Cruise, Minority Report, you have seen the movie. This is real now. We can go inside the data, pull this out. There are lots of dangers with this as well, obviously, like addiction. Like if you work with virtual reality all day long, you come home in the evening and your family is very boring because you don't have the glasses anymore. It's, you don't have the input anymore. It's like the mobile phone, you get sort of addicted to that. But this is, for example, supply chain in 2030. Basically, uh, people run, working in supply chain will become superhuman by having live information of every single step in the food chain. And therefore, we can hugely save on all kinds of things, even without switching to renewable energy. <laughs> We have already achieved half the mission when we do this. Very powerful stuff. So, Thomson Reuters says, every professional will have an AI assistant within the next three years. That is like Siri, but a thousand times as good. So you can sit down in the morning, you can say, okay, tell me what I should look at first. You don't look at the emails. And sort it, all taken care of. And you do the things that we do best, which is what? Making judgment, solving difficult problems, negotiating, working with other humans, applying human judgments, for example, social security. We can't use the machine to tell how much retirement benefit you're going to get because there are other rules apart from mathematics and logistics. So very powerful stuff that we're going to see here. This is Thomson Reuters co-counsel. If you're a lawyer, you will appreciate this. I, it's probably a bit of a hype thing around this right now, but it's basically an artificially intelligent legal service. Well, you get the point, yeah? Let's not expect miracles here, right? This, this is a machine that looks up documents and does due diligence, and then you can believe it or not. It's not going to replace anything. But imagine if I have to, as a lawyer, I have to read a PDF, you know, every three hours I have to read 500 pages. How do I do that? I can use the machine to screen. Save me time. Make me faster. Augment what I do. What we do not want is this. We don't want a world that's run by artificial general intelligence where everything is under control of some digital entity that we know we don't know who they are and what are they doing. It's a black box called a black box. It's like eating, smoking alcohol. Too much of a good thing is a very bad thing. This is, of course, a problem of things that we tend to do too much of, and the same goes for technology. So what we need to focus on in business is the first one. Not AI, but IA, intelligent assistant. That is basically smart software, smart systems, smart networks, deep learning, machine learning, as was said earlier, to solve practical problems. And most of those are pretty much nuts and bolts. They're not 
ex machina type problems. And then eventually we're going to graduate into a world where we have more intelligent agents that can do things on our behalf if we want that. What we do not want is the last one. This is what OpenAI wants to build, right? Artificial general intelligence. A machine with an IQ higher than all of humanity combined. Right now, the most advanced machine has an IQ roughly of Elon Musk, around 150. If you had a machine that had an IQ intelligence of 250, we would not understand a single thing that it's talking about. It would be so far removed, like, you know, a regular person talking to Einstein would not understand much of what he's saying. He had an IQ of about 180 or something. So, if we do that, then basically we would be out of control very quickly. <laughs> you can imagine a machine would not care for us so much. I think Elon Musk always says it's like we're stepping in the forest and on the forest floor, there are lots of ants. We kill all the ants. We don't even know they exist and it's not by purpose. It would be like this with the AI that basically wouldn't even know that we're still there. <laughs> so that's something we have to think about. That is the thing that we don't want, but it's not here. So I use AI for practical things. I'm pretty popular on YouTube. I have about 320,000 subscribers and I make lots of videos on YouTube. And I don't want to always sit down the camera. So now I have an app called Hey Jen. It made an avatar with me. Looking very real. And my voice. Ladies and gentlemen. We stand on the precipice of a future that is unfolding at a speed unprecedented in human history. The convergence of technology and humanity is not just reshaping our lives, it's redefining what it means to be human. Yeah, and it speaks Greek too. Όπου η τεχνητή νοημοσύνη, η κυβαντική πληροφορική και η βιοτεχνολογία συγχωνεύονται με την καθημερινή μας Right, so, you know, you can see I'm moving around with the hands a little bit. It looks weird, right? But considering that it's me, you know, I can replicate myself now a million times in different videos and just type the text. And I will even make the text for me. A lot of that is very useless because it doesn't mean anything. It's like you would never watch a motion picture, a movie in a theater or a cinema that's written by an AI. That's because it's like you're going to eat food from the tube rather than going to a restaurant. So people are going to keep going to restaurants <laughs> Just they will, they will keep making videos. But I like it a lot because it makes me look better. That, that's the best purpose. There's this is an app that takes your photos and redoes your photos. And so it makes me look better in many ways because I can appear to be much further along than I have been. And then I can catch up in peace, you know, while people think about what I've said. So Elon, my good friend Elon and Donald, that was using AI to cut them together. And by having the right commands, the software went on the internet, it got all the clips, it got the music and did it all by itself. No producer involved. This is a prompt here. Make a monkey that plays chess. That's the command to the software, a software called Sora from OpenAI. It'll be out shortly. So the software made a film that had a monkey playing chess, but check this out. The chess board is not human, that's for sure. It has three kings and seven fields. So those are the details that AI doesn't get. You know, It just makes a monkey with a playing chess. So this is a guy who takes a PDF, upload it to ChatGPT, one of the most popular programs. It's a really super complicated PDF on blockchain and those kind of nothing that you would want to read. And you upload it to the chat GPT where you can upload any document you want. And it will analyze the document and come back so you can ask questions about the document. Any document. So this is now basically saying in this process, boiling it down to a bunch of summaries. And here's a summary of the document. 750 page document. Now you can say it's not accurate. Yeah, that is true. But better than to have it than not, right? Because you can still say, I should read the document. 
So anything practical like doctor reports, you know, imagine a doctor, you know, every day we have hundreds of new research reports. How is a doctor going to read all these things? Now the AI can do that for us. The AI makes terrible mistakes. You ask the question, how long was the train ride from New York to Rome? You cannot take the train from New York to Rome, but you know, the AI says it's four hours. That's because it's talking about Rome, Delaware. Didn't get the drift. And I asked the AI to make an image of the Pope that is gender balanced. So it's making a black Pope and a female Pope. You know, there's no such thing, obviously. Female, definitely not. So it's making stuff up. It's hallucinating, which is part of the program. So bottom line is really this. If you're looking for AI to help you, it would be about data, information, and some kind of knowledge some kind of knowledge. Human knowledge is different because you have knowledge that's 360 degrees, smelling, feeling, touching, sensing, watching. That's what we do. The AI has three or 5% of that. It only sees numbers. Remember that it does not know what it means to be anything. It just looks at data. But very useful because if I can take that here and use my human skills, like we have down here on this row, it's very bad with insights, wisdom. Yeah, no, that's not an AI thing. Foresight, understanding, interpretation. Give you an example. Your son comes home from school. He's 13 years old. He smiles like a mad person. And then, you know, before that, he was telling you about the, the grades he's got or the bus or, and all of a sudden he sits there and just smiling and, looking really stupid, and then you know he's fallen in love. But he's not telling you. You don't have any data to support this. You just know. This is what we do. That's what you do with clients, because you understand the client not just because of data, because of everything else. That's what we do. So it's very important that we use AI for this, and this really comes down to this handshake. So now AI is capable of talking to other AIs. This is coming in a, in a few years where you can just sit down and say, I need to go to Rio de Janeiro. You know what I like. Go off and book the ticket. You can kind of do that now in Expedia or so, but this will be fully interactive, getting the, the best possible seat and deal and payment you know, automatically. One AI talking to the other AI. I don't know how good that will be, but... I always say it could be heaven or it could be hell. Because it can create whole new business models or destroy old business models. I used to be in the music business. We sold records. You know, round things. What do we sell today in the music business? Mm -hmm, let's see. Let me talk. Oh, the stream. The performance. But Spotify brings in about $1 billion a month and new money. So that's a pretty good swap. So in Greece, people are both excited, but mostly scared about artificial intelligence. The research from the same company from February shows. So first on personal health, it's positive, plus 36%, because the data can help me to be more prepared and to understand my health. It's quite clear. That's an opportunity. Society, Greek people say about 3,500 Greek people were interviewed in February. 53% say it's bad for society. And it gets worse because now you're looking at jobs. 69% say it's going to be bad for work. So we have to understand how we use it in such a way where we can take the benefits, which there are many, without the negative side effects. And how do we do that? We got to think about regulation, about social contracts. Our politicians have to finally go to the future. This is why it's so important that we have a framework. Because, you know, technology drives societies, but values and ethics make the definition. That's what we think of as important. So we should not go in the future and think of AI like this. 
because it's a technology that is basically a general purpose technology. This would be like saying I don't use a mobile phone. Some people do, but not very many. This is like saying you will not put your company on the cloud. Remember that 10 years ago? Everybody said, I, I won't go on the cloud, it's dangerous. Every company is on the cloud. <laughs> right? so every company has mobile applications. Pretty much every company. So AI is kind of like this. We have to use the Italian poet Gramsci as a good example. Pessimism of the intellect, the thinking. Optimism of the mind. Well, he was, uh, you know, pretty famous writer. It's easy for him to say, but we have to think of the critical things, but we have to not give up that it could be good. I always say optimism of the heart. And so we have to believe also that other people aren't evil. There's many examples of people that are evil, but generally speaking, we should think about things that are possible. So this is what our job is in the future in business and in society, is to be proactive and to be careful. Especially if you're using AI, because you do not want to treat people like numbers. You don't want the information to go out. You don't want them to feel treated like an algorithm. <laughs> the opposite is what you want to achieve. And there have been many examples how that didn't work. That's going to change our entire industry. So I get to summarize. Basically, keep in mind with machines, algorithms, machines don't think. They don't have hunches seeing they don't understand, really. They look at numbers. Imagine you're a partner, your husband or wife would just look at your numbers and, and not at you. That would be like a very small piece of satisfaction. <laughs> machines don't imagine, machines don't care because they don't exist. Nevertheless, what they can do is all the other things, you know, the routine, the commodity work, the donkey work, you could say. What we do is this. I call this the andro rhythms, the human, not the algorithms, but the human rhythms. Emotions, creativity, this is what we have to learn. This is what we have to teach our kids. This is what we have to teach our staff. Because that is what will matter. All the other stuff, the heavy lifting, the logic machines will do. This is why in school we have to learn how to do this. If you get an MBA, you should understand other people, not just understand business models. Because business models are numbers. Machines will beat us. So the bottom line is we have machines. We'll use all of that stuff powered by super intelligent machines, quantum computers that can process my DNA in 14 seconds. That's not far away. So I can go to a date and compare my DNA with my date DNA to see how far I want to go. Data, logic, information, that's what machines do. Machines don't do consciousness. It's impossible for machines and probably will stay impossible, I hope. This is what we do, understanding, imagination, intuition, purpose, and the last one's most important values. In Europe, we are humanists, pretty much every country in Europe. In America, I'm not so sure. I think there are humanists in America, but, but it's more like about progressive capitalism. In China, it's the state that takes the values. So it's a very different discussion in Europe that I think we should keep alive. Artificial intelligence is a power tool. And you know what happens with power tools? The people with power tools beat the people without the power tools. It's as simple as that. The tool itself will do nothing. It may be able to do something, but it doesn't do anything. Like, you know, if you take a power drill, it just doesn't do anything. This is why we need to use technology to give us more power, not to disempower us. Anyway, I always say, if you work like a robot, a robot will take your job. Any job that you do that a robot could do, you should give up that job. Like a call center, 90%. But a lawyer, does a lawyer do robot work? A little bit, yeah, depending on what kind of law you do. You look up things, you file things, you organize. Machine software can do that. 
So we have to move on into a different world. So let me summarize. Melon tiki, what? You get it, right? Future readiness. Melon tiki is a good word. Riffing off melon, of course, the future. But future readiness, uh, we need to think of a new economic logic. And we need to let go of all the past that we have behind us. Socialism, communism, populism, capitalism, fascism. None of that matters anymore because the only thing that matters is how do we get here? And we need an economic, you know, there are economic leaders around the world, including Argentina, the new guy in Argentina. This is what he's talking about. And he's not left wing. We need to figure out how we get to this point where we can have more than one objective, people, planet, purpose, companies, countries. So for Greece, we have this amazing past. Greece, the, bir the birthplace of thinking, really, in so many ways, the birthplace of democracy. Now the future comes down to connectivity, to intelligence, to sustainability, to collaboration, and to tell us the purpose, the understanding, the wisdom. We will not have a good future with just technology. That's the story of Meta and Microsoft and OpenAI. We just use more technology to solve every problem. There's no such thing. Technology makes new problems uh, that we then have to solve. So I, I'll end with the quote by Barbara Marx Hubbard, who said, as you see the future, so you act, as you act, so you become. That's self-fulfilling prophecy. Think the future as bad or as good? We got to think of the future as being good. And riffing off the document I got from the National Bank of Greece was contained in this little message here. Right? We have to be fit for the future, respect for the past, and engagement in the present. Not just one of these. We can't just have respect for the past. That's a good thing. But where is that going to get us into the future? The future is different than the past. The future is not just an extension of the past. It's the opposite. As a record company, we sold records and now we sell clicks. So we need to do all these three things. If you're in business, that's the mission. To be fit for the future, to look at all of those things. So I close with the message I started with. The future is better than you think. And it's fully up to us to make that into fruition, to bring it about, to make it happen. Thank you very much for your time.